Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar on plasma powder spherodization arranged by Future Materials Norwegian Cannibal Center in collaboration with Mechatronics Innovation Lab and Techna. Some of you may know the Norwegian Cannibal Center already, but for those of you who are not familiar with this scheme, I will briefly describe what we are. Our mission is to accelerate the process from concept to market launch in product development. We have a focus on small and medium-sized businesses, but are also working with larger companies, entrepreneurs, academia, and research organizations. We provide premises, equipment, and competence for testing, simulation, and visualization of technology, products, and solutions. So, how do we do that? Future Materials has, as you can see on the right side of this slide, very skilled partners and owners providing the relevant competence and equipment for material testing. Through our capital center, US company, University of Research Institute will have access to all these test facilities as these premises. This is really sharing economy in practice. Today, we will present one of the specific technology which is available at our partner Mechatronics Innovation Lab, the Tech 15 system from Techna. I am happy to hand over the scene to PhD and CDO of Mechatronics Innovation Lab, Martin Back. Thank you much, very much, uh, Aslok. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and then I will share my screen. Just give me a second here. And hopefully you can all see my screen as well. Does it look okay, Aslak? I think it should work fine now. Very good. Okay, thank you, Aslak, for, for the introduction. Um, as as Aslak said, my name is Morten Bach. I'm the CTO of Mechatronics Innovation Lab. And uh, today, before we, we move on with the main topic of the webinar, which is uh, uh, plasma sterilization uh, technology presented by Tecna, I will give you a, a brief overview of uh, the, uh, the equipment we have at uh, our facilities in Grimstad, uh, namely the Tech 15 induction plasma systems from, from Tecna, which can actually be used for several purposes, which we will also talk briefly about uh, today. Um, before I do that, I would uh, like to spend just a few words uh, uh, on Mechatronics Innovation Lab and what we are. Uh, so, Mechatronics Innovation Lab is a test and um, innovation uh, center uh, in the so southern part of Norway, uh, which is, uh, serves basically one purpose, and that is to help the industry. Uh, help the industry become uh, more competitive, more innovative, uh, etc., by introducing new technology, testing new solutions, uh, etc., within the field of mechatronics where we work. Um, and of course, mechatronics is, is a wide field of uh, technologies and we work with everything from uh, sensor technology, robotics, uh, automation in general, um, fluid power technology, uh, different sorts of uh, uh, large scale component testing, um, AR, VR technology, machine learning, etc. And we also work within the field of, uh, field of uh, materials technology um, uh, and especially uh, the, the, area of um, the area of materials technology that is related to additive manufacturing, which is one of our uh, main focus area in, in Mechatronics Innovation Lab. We also work to some extent with the traditional manufacturing such as uh, machining, uh, different metrology uh, uh, methods such as uh, 3D scanning and so on. So we cover a, a quite wide field um, for, the, for the industry, not only the in Norwegian industry, I have to say, we are also very much available for international customers. We have many international partners and we are always uh, interested in, in hearing from, from any, any of uh, you abroad that would uh, be interested in, in working together with us. Okay, and 
as as Lark also mentioned, we are also uh, a proud partner of uh, Future Materials together with a number of other partners that together cover quite a, a large field within materials technology. Um, so please uh, get in touch if you would like to hear more about this. Um, Otherwise, I think we just move on to today's topic and here is the, the machine, the equipment that we will uh, focus on for the next uh, minutes. It's a uh, Tecna machine from Tecna, the Tech 15 plasma induction plasma system, which uh, as I said, can be used for different purposes. Uh, this is a 15 kilowatt machine and uh, the, the smallest uh, scale uh, of uh, systems that uh, Tecna offer. It's an uh, R&D machine, lab scale machine, uh, and it's the same type of machine or technology is all, also available in, in 40 kilowatts, 80 kilowatts and so on. Um, so the machine we see here, you see here the, the, the machine, the actual machine that is installed in our facilities. And uh, the machine itself has, uh, just to give you an idea of the size, a footprint of about one uh, by two and a half meters, and it's about two and a half, three, three meters tall, uh, as you can see in this picture. Um, just give me a second here. Um, yeah, I hope you can all see my, my uh, sorry, maybe I should um, just give me a second here. Um, yeah, okay, so I can point better. Um, so you see here in front of this machine, there is an operator panel. There is a, a screen here uh, for a uh, PC uh, used to control the, the uh, PLC and a control system on the machine. There's a panel here to, to adjust the levels and flow of gas that is used in the process. The primary gas used in the plasma process is argon. Uh, typically, we use hydrogen as a secondary uh, gas, but it could also be um, helium, uh, uh, nitrogen, or even oxygen used as a secondary gas, but typically we use uh, hydrogen. Uh, there is also a second, um, second control panel here, which is actually used for one of the feeders that you see here on top of the machine that is used to feed uh, the precursor or the uh, the feedstock into the into the machine and uh, this is one of several feeders that are available for the system we also have a small uh, um, uh, vibratory uh, feeder available for the machine this is a disc feeder that is used uh, in in most cases i would say to feed um the precursor into the process we also have a third feeder that is uh, uh, used for nanopowder more uh, powder that is uh, with with poor flowability i would say in the back here you could also see another unit just for information this is an external external filter unit that is used in one of the configurations that the machine can be used for that we will also talk briefly about later uh, so what we'll do now, we will have a closer look at uh, the really interesting part here of the machine, the process compartment, which will uh, give you some more idea of how the machine uh, works and what is it, what it's used for. So, so now we're looking inside the process compartment, which itself is actually a Faraday cage because the induction plasma uh, works on uh, high voltage and very high frequency so so it's all protected by a faraday cage here for for the safety of the operators um, and so on um, and we have several main components uh, here in the process compartment and we will have uh, now a walkthrough of the components and then afterwards we will talk briefly about the the processes um, which uh, the machine can be used for uh, first of all here on top uh, we are now just below the feed that we talked about before. Here is an injection probe, which is used to feed uh, the precursor, uh, the, the feedstock into the plasma flame uh, below here, which is generated by the plasma torch. Uh, so the powder comes through here and into the plasma flame. And below here we have what we call the reactor, which is basically in this case just a big chamber. And this reactor will will look uh, different uh, different uh, depending on 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 the process you are working on. Um, today we will talk about the spheroidization process, and this is the spheroidization reactor. We have different reactors for this system, which we will talk about in a minute. After the reactor, there is a cyclone, um, and after that again there is a filter. 
And beneath uh, these three main components, there are uh, collection canisters um, to, to collect the material. And we will talk more about that in a minute. Um, of course, there is also a way out of the system. There is an exhaust here, which actually leads to a vacuum pump on the back of the machine, which again leads to a uh, exhaust system leaning out of the build and building to, to get rid of the, the gases and the fumes from the process. Uh, and as we are also using, um, for instance, hydrogen in, in, the, in the process, there is also a flame arrester on the exhaust as, 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 as we're working with flammable uh, gases. Also for safety purposes, there is a rupture disc with a separate exhaust system which protects uh, the system and, and uh, the uh, operators, etc., from uh, too high pressure. So they, if the pressure becomes too high, the rupture disc will, will, um, will break and relieve uh, the pressure inside the system. So, so this is a brief overview of the, the main components uh, used in the process, uh, which we now will have a closer look at. Um, here we see the setup for the spheroidization process, which uh, Jochen from uh, Tecna will talk more about in a few minutes. Um, we have the same system as we talk, uh, looked at just before, uh, only in a more simplified uh, schematic here. Again, uh, on top, we will have material uh, coming from the feeder and the material here, the precursor is, is, is um, uh, typically a crushed powder. Um, there are also other types of, of feeders available for the system, but in, in this case, we are most often used uh, talking about crushed powder. Uh, with that, we feed through the probe and into uh, the plasma flame, which is generated generated just be below the, the plasma torch here. Uh, the plasma flame is around 10,000 degrees. So, so in, with this technology, you can you can process um, almost any material, even something like tungsten, which has a melting temperature of more than 3,000 degrees. Uh, and below here, again, we have the plasma reactor. Uh, and below here, we have a, a canister to, to collect the spheroidized, uh, spheroidized uh, particles, uh, and um, which is the main collection. And the smaller particles that are not trapped here, they will go into the cyclone where we have a second collection, and the even smaller particles will go to the filter where we can also collect those particles. So this is one setup, uh, which is uh, for, for the spheroidization process which the system can be used for. It also has three other, uh, sorry, two other configurations. Uh, one other configuration we see here is the nano, um, is the setup with the nano reactor to do a nanosynthesis, that is uh, uh, generation of nanoparticles. It's, it's uh, basically the same setup, only that here in the um, uh, nano uh, reactor, we we don't we we not only melt materials down to generate um, particles. We actually achieve a full evaporation to to generate those small nanoparticles. And again, uh, those particles would travel through the cyclone. As you see here, we now don't have a main collection below the reactor because what we want to achieve here is 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 what we uh, collect in in the fine filter. So here. Our main product will be collected in the filter as, as, as what we are looking for here is to, to generate uh, nanoparticles. And as, um, as um, the main product or the main, um, yeah, the main product here is at the nanoparticle, uh, this small filter we're looking at here could, uh, could become a, a, a limitation. So uh, you uh, you can also use uh, the bigger external uh, filter unit that we saw in in a, in a previous picture to to run more continuous uh, operations. The last configuration is is uh, the deposition setup or coating setup, where instead of um, uh, a reactor, instead of the other two reactors, we have also a kind of reactor, a chamber where we have a displacement system, basically uh, um, um, an arm mounted on a servo motor that is able to um, rotate and reposition your specimen that you want to coat. So again, your, your feedstock, your precursor would uh, be fed through the injection probe into the plasma flame where it is melted. 
and deposit it onto your substrate, uh, whatever you want to code um, in, in the particular case. Of course, this is a smaller setup meant for R&D purposes. So, so in this case, the setup is, is used for coding research, um, etc. And again, you have the cyclone and the filter to collect the particles that are not deposited on, on, the, um, on the substrate here in, in the deposit uh, reactor. So that was a brief overview of the system we have and what it can be used for. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Uh, if we have time for some questions, or we should do that at the very end. Uh, if there are no questions, um, I would just uh, like to say thank you for your attention for this part. Uh, here you also have my contact information. You can also find that on our webpage. Unfortunately, at the moment, the web page is only in Norwegian, but there is some information available on a web page in English. Uh, but anyway, uh, please just uh, reach out, get in touch if there is anything you would like to ask or discuss with us. Okay, Aslok, that's that's it for me. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Uh, we have not received any questions yet, so I think uh, people are just a bit overwhelmed over all the information you gave them uh, right away. But we're still waiting for, for Q&A and we can take that later on in the discussion. So let me introduce our next speaker, which is uh, PhD Jochen Altenberendt, which is um, who is the Technical Sales Manager of Europe Plasma System at Tecna. Please. Can you hear me and see my screen, everybody? Or a slog? Yes, we can hear you and see your screen. Okay, great. So yeah, I want to thank uh, Aslog from uh, Future Materials Norwegian Catapult Center and Morten from MIL for the organizing this webinar. And also thank you for the kind introduction. I would like to uh, start my presentation by introducing myself. I graduated in physics from Grenoble ENP and Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And at the end of my studies, I got fascinated by the inductively coupled plasma torch. Therefore, I was doing my PhD on the studying this uh, plasma torch. And we, we were using this plasma torch for the purification of silicon for solar cells. More recently, I worked on the development of an aluminum powder alloy for the SLM process. And I joined Tecna around four months ago. And I, as, uh, as Locke said, I'm now in charge of the, the sales of plasma systems for Europe. The objective of my presentation today is to give you an insight in the plasma powder spherodization technology. So, I will start my presentation by giving a, you an, uh, to pre a presentation of the corporate profile of Tecna. Then I will show you the, our core technology. And afterwards, I will present you the plasma powder spherodization process. I will show you several examples of powder spherodization and uh, applications of spherodized powder in additive manufacturing. I will finish my presentation by giving you an overview of, on our plasma system portfolio. So uh, let's start with the corporate profile. So uh, Tecna is actually part of a Norwegian holding with the name Arendals Fosse Company. Please excuse me if my pronunciation is not so Norwegian. Uh, Arendals Fosse Company was founded in 1896 and is listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange. It is an investment company that owns energy and technology related companies. You can see here below a list of the companies that are part of this holding and Tecna is uh, one of the companies. Now a bit more about the company Tecna itself. The company Tecna was founded in 1990 in Sherbrooke, Canada, around the inductively coupled plasma technology. We have today around 170 employees, and our main activities are the manufacturing of plasma systems, 
and the production of spherical powders and nanomaterials. Here you can see our worldwide footprint. Since 1990, we have a factory in Sherbrooke, Canada, where is also our headquarter for the manufacturing of plasma systems. Since 2010, we have a second factory that is doing powder production, also in Sherbrooke, Canada. We have a second site in Europe, in Macon, in France. At this site, we produce powder for the European market, especially nickel superalloys. The European powder sales team, myself and myself, are also based here in Macon. Other sites for sales have been founded in India, China and Korea. So now I will come to the core technology of Tecna. The core technology of Tecna is the inductively coupled plasma torch. The torch itself, it consists mainly on a tube. We see here this uh, gray bars indicate the tube. And we inject the gas inside this tube. As uh, Morten said before, it's uh, mostly argon uh, with some other gas, very often hydrogen. Uh, around this tube, we have an inductor where we can apply a radio frequency current. This radio frequency current in the inductor then induces a second current inside the plasma. The second current uh, flows in a circle around the central axis of the plasma and thereby heats up the gas. It heats up the gas to around 10,000 Kelvin. The volume of this plasma is quite large and therefore allows for particles that are injected inside to have a relatively long residence time. When the particles fly through the plasma, they have a relatively long residence time. This uh, long residence time increases the energy efficiency and also allows to treat a wide range of material with low and high melting points. This makes it a very flexible process. While other uh, plasma technologies often use electrodes, the inductively coupled plasma is completely free of electrodes. Being free of electrodes means also that there is no uh, consumption of the, uh, these electrodes and no pollution that could come from these electrodes. Therefore, it is a high purity process. The plasma uh, doesn't have any thermal inertia. It can very rapidly uh, uh, start it up and shut down. We have done around three decades of research and development on the inductively coupled plasma and still continue to improve this technology. Over the years, we have identified several tech applications where this technology brings significant benefits. As uh, Morten already uh, explained the several applications before, the main applications are spherical, the production of spherical powders, the production of nanopowders and some other applications. The first category, the spherical powders, which is the topic of today's presentation, is mainly dedicated to additive manufacturing and other powder metallurgy applications, for example, metal injection molding. In the second category, we have the nanopowders, which are today mainly used in uh, microelectronics and batteries, for example, for the silicon anode in lithium ion batteries. In the third category, we uh, have some other applications where we use, for example, the plasma torch to simulate the plasma that is met by spacecrafts when they are entering the atmosphere of Earth or another planet. And we have uh, the possibility, as it is a high purity process, we can do uh, high purity coatings with a purity that is significantly higher than conventional coating techniques. Now, uh, and we are so we are using this uh, plasma technology for the powder spherodization, and I will give you now more insight how this powder spherodization works. So we can use uh, uh, many different types of powder as uh, feedstock and transform them in high to highly spherical powder. In order to do this, we inject the powder 
in the on inside the plasma torch from the top and then when uh, a powder particle like we have it here in this schematic it uh, goes through the plasma it takes up the heat from the gas from this uh, very hot gas when it heats up at one moment it melts and when it is molten it uh, the surface tension makes that it uh, transform into a spherical droplet this spherical droplet then uh, cools down and solidifies and uh, while it solidifies it keeps its spherical shape the reactor here below the plasma torch is designed high enough so that all particles have uh, enough time to solidify so that they can then be recovered as uh, highly spherical powder at the bottom of the reactor as we heat up the material a small fraction may evaporate this uh, small fraction then condenses as a fine dust that is carried to the filter and can there be recovered as a waste material however this fraction is usually uh, very small so that the typical yield in the production of powder spherization is more than 95 percent to better understand how this spherization work we now have a look at results from numerical modeling. Here an example of the numerical modeling of spheroidization of molybdenum powder. On the left, we have the temperature map uh, of the plasma when we don't inject the powder. Here the green points are, represent the inductor. So here we induce the current inside the plasma. We have here a current that turns in a circle around the central axis of the plasma torch and therefore in this region we have the highest temperature. But also in the central region we have still a very high temperature of around 10,000 Kelvin. When we inject the plasma in the center we have here again the same temperature map but with uh, injecting powder in the plasma. The, temp the powder takes up energy from the gas and therefore the temperature of the gas here in the center is uh, significantly lower. On the right, we have a temperature map of the powder particles, uh, this time with a different uh, color scale. The powders are injected in a gas stream, so we inject here a powder gas mixture that comes in with a relatively low temperature of around uh, th 300 Kelvin. When the particles fly through the plasma, first the particles are the side, they get a lot of heat and heat uh, increase in temperature. And then also the particles in the center of the stream uh, heat up to a temperature of around 3,500 Kelvin. This is significantly higher than the melting point of molybdenum, which is around 2,900 Kelvin. Therefore, we make sure that all particles are melted and transform into spherical particles. We inject the particles not li like above the plasma, but really like in the center of the plasma to make sure that there are no particles that could uh, touch the side of the torch, the walls of the torch, and could remain sticking there. We now have a look at the powder properties that we can, can achieve after spherodization. Here we have a graph of the Hausner ratio. The Hausner ratio is uh, the ratio between tap density and apparent density and is very often used to evaluate if a powder is well adapted for additive manufacturing. Uh, usually a lower Hausner ratio is better for additive manufacturing because then you can uh, obtain in powder bed processes a uh, very dense and homogeneous powder layer. The plasma spheroidization process obtains powder with a Hausner ratio of 1.1, which is very low, while pre typical precursor materials like crushed, sponge or reduced powder have higher Hausner ratio between 1.3 and almost 1.6. The plasma spheroidized powder has even a lower Hausner ratio than gas atomized powder, which is also often used in additive manufacturing. This lower Hausner ratio is mainly due to the high sphericity, 
but also to, to the fact that there are almost no satellites and to the sp special properties of the surface of the powder. Now I will show you several powder spheroidization examples. I will start here with an example of the spheroidization of tantalum powder that is used in the medical industry for printing of implants. On the left here, we see a micrograph of the precursor powder that is very angular and spongy. And on the right, we see the spheroidized powder that has a very nice spherical shape. The magnification here is 200 on the left and 50 on the right, so the pictures cannot be compared directly. We observe an increase in the tap density from 5.9 to 7.9. And we also observe a purification. The nickel content goes down from 100 ppm to 40 ppm. And the aluminum content is uh, aluminum being more volatile. It goes down from 14 ppm to 1 ppm. So in general, when we uh, do spheroidization, we observe a reduction of the volatile elements. Here in my second example, we I show you a, a spheroidization of tungsten powder. We have a precursor material, a very angular powder. And after spheroidization, the powder is uh, very nice and spherical. Here, the magnification is the same for the two. It's, uh, we, these are SEM micrographs. The tap density again increases uh, significantly. And we can see that the precursor material doesn't flow in the whole flow test, while the plasma spheroidized powder shows a very good flowability of seven seconds for 50 grams. In general, when we do spheroidization, we can transform a no flow powder into a highly uh, powder with a very good flowability. Here in this example, we have the spheroidization of spray dried uh, tantalum tungsten alloy. The, here's the SEM micrograph of the precursor material which is the uh, spray dried powder, which consists of acclimated tantalum particles and tungsten particles that are held together with a binder. During this spheroidization, the binder is removed. So, and therefore we observe a reduction of the carbon content from 5,400 to 750 ppm. The, we can also see that the Precursor material is uh, very porous and the uh, spheroidized powder is then completely dense without porosity. We also observe uh, a reduction of the oxygen content, which is due to the re uh, reduction by the hydrogen gas, uh, which was used in this spheroidization experiment. In this example, I show you the spheroidization of uh, spray dried molybdenum powder. On the left, we have SEM micrographs of the feedstock powders. And on the right, we have uh, SEM micrographs of uh, spheroidized powders. These spheroidized powders were obtained with different feed rates. The highest feed rates being here three times higher than the lowest feed rate. We can see that at the lowest feed rate, uh, all particles are completely spherical, while at uh, the highest feed rate, some particles are not completely spherical, so they have also only be partially melted. This then also can, this has an also an effect on the tap density that is uh, significantly higher for the lower feed rate, and also the flowability is better for the lower feed rate. So then for uh, an application, we can find an optimum between uh, the best powder properties and uh, better productivity and thus lower cost. In this example, we have a gas atomized powder that has already relatively good properties for additive manufacturing. But uh, in this case was not in spec for the application. 
In this example, we can see that the powder size distribution remains essentially the same before and after spheroidization. Here we see D10 and D90 before and after spheroidization. Because every particle melts separately and solidifies separately, there's uh, essentially no change in the powder size distribution. Here we see again a reduction of the oxygen content, which is due to the reducing effect of the hydrogen gas and due to the fact that the oxide layer of this alloy is not very stable. We can use many different gases in the spheroidization process and therefore modify the chemistry of the surface of the particles. Besides this deoxidation that we have here, we can also do nitridation, carburation, and oxidation. As a summary, we can uh, use many kinds of different powder for this fertilization process, atomized, crushed, spongy powder, spray dried powder, and AM recycled powder, and transform them into highly spherical powder with is free of porosities, free of satellites, they show a high flowability, high packing density, and a high purity. So altogether, they fulfill the key powder requirements for powder metallurgy applications and uh, especially additive manufacturing. Yeah, it's a, another measurement method to choose the high quality of this powder. It's the relative apparent density, which is the ratio between the apparent density and the bulk density of the dense material, not the bulk density of the powder, the bulk density of the really dense material. The precursor material has a relat uh, relatively low relative apparent density of around uh, 30% because there's a lot of gas or air between the particles and when it's porous also inside the particles. A gas atomized powder has a significantly higher relative apparent density and the plasma spheroidized powder has then a very high relative apparent density of around 60%. Now we have seen several examples of spheroidized powder. Now I will show you some examples of applications in additive manufacturing. I will start with uh, an example from Mr. Sindamba and his colleagues from the University of Livermore, who used uh, powder produced by tungsten powder produced by spheroidization to print a collimator with a very long and thin hole. Yes, there's a 40 millimeter long and only 0.5 millimeter wide hole in this collimator. And they needed this geometry to obtain a uh, collimated uh, gamma ray beam for the characterization of a detector. Uh, here we see a, a micrograph of this uh, very thin, only 0.5 millimeter wide hole. So this is a good example that shows how this highly spherical powder can be used to print very demanding geometries. In my second uh, example, I show you here this uh, project from Rick Lowton and his colleagues from Oak Ridge National Laboratory who work on the production of molybdenum MO99 isotope. This isotope is used for medical imaging. They uh, use uh, the standard molybdenum 100 uh, isotope powder to, that is obtained by powder spheroidization to print discs with holes inside, like this disc here and this disc here. These discs are then exposed to an electron beam from an accelerator, and the electron beam transforms the molybdenum 100 isotope into the molybdenum 99 isotope. Due to the electron beam, there's a lot of heat generated in the disc, and the helium flow that flows through these small holes evacuates the heat and therefore remains the disc at a cool temperature. It's another example that shows how very complex geometries can be printed by using plasma spheroidized powder.
the pro this project of Oak Ridge National Laboratory also includes the recycling of the spent radio pharmaceutical solutions that has been used for medical imaging. The, um, this uh, complex molecule is first reduced and the reduced powder it has a very low packing density and therefore three grams take up a lot of volume. After spherodization, the packing density is very strongly increased and then therefore the three grams of powder only takes up a small volume. This illustrates very well how the density of the powder is increased and therefore also the printability. Now we have seen uh, examples of spherodization. We have seen uh, examples of application additive manufacturing. Now I will guide you through the system portfolio that uh, can be used to uh, do this spherodization. The system portfolio goes from uh, 15 kilowatt to 350 kilowatt, from R&D scale and very small production scale to uh, full industrial production scale. There are several intermediate sizes to so that we for every uh, requirement we can uh, adjust the productivity of the equipment. The Texfero 15 unit is the one that is installed in MIL and that uh, Morten has so very well explained uh, right before. As he said, it's uh, very small. It fits through every door and uh, fits in every laboratory. And uh, it can pr produce uh, small batches of many different materials, but can also be used for longer, longer runs with a productivity of around 0 0.5 to 1.5 kilograms per hour. It's a turnkey uh, solution with uh, several embedded security systems. The next larger scale is the, the pilot scale units, which is uh, designed for rather small scale production or larger scale R&D. It can be operated in continuous or batch production it has a very easy maintenance and uh, productivity of three to eight kilograms per hour. The industrial scale unit is, uh, has a power of 200 to 350 kilowatt and is really designed for industrial production for 24 seven continuous operation. It includes uh, gas recycling to significantly reduce the gas consumption uh, usually it's dedicated to a single material as it is required by aerospace or medical industry standards. It comes with the highest safety standards and also with uh, TECNAS process optimization support to get the best productivity and the best powder quality out of this system. The productivity is uh, 10 to 30 kilogram per hour. Of course, the productivity depends uh, a lot on of the material. Some materials have higher productivity and other a uh, bit lower productivities. As I said in the beginning of my presentation, some part of the powder may uh, evaporate and uh, condense as fine dust. We see here powder where uh, some of the fine dust is then loosely uh, sticking to the surface of the powder. This dust can very easily be removed with our powder sonic uh, cleaning system. This then uh, further improves the flowability, the tap density and uh, it reduces the oxygen content due to the lower specific surface. As a conclusion, I would like to say uh, that the plasma powder spherodization technology is uh, very well adapted to produce highly spherical powder that are ideal for additive manufacturing. It is a very flexible process that works for a wide range of materials with low and high melting points for metals, carbides and oxides. It is a high purity process without any pollution that could come from electrodes and other plasma processes. It's a process without thermal inertia that allows a quick startup and shutdown. 
Tecna's value-added proposition for this process is a very strong R&D expertise. And uh, we offer powder processing scalability from the lab scale unit to the full industrial scale unit. We can also offer process development to deliver turnkey industrial solutions dedicated to a material. Plasma spheroidization technology and inductively coupled plasma technology is today a major technology. We are more than 30 years in business. We have sold uh, more than 200 systems worldwide. And we have a, can offer a continuous process with 24 seven operation. Uh, at the end here, you, uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, related to uh, this uh, powder spheroidization technology, feel free to contact me. I really invite you to, to think about all the powders that you are aware where you think maybe they could easily be transformed into a highly spherical powder that is uh, at, can then be uh, used in additive manufacturing and used to print very complex geometries. For small case trials, of course, I invite you to contact uh, Morton who can do these trials. And if you have other questions, feel free to contact me. Please also note that there are some other webinars coming up. End of January, we will give a webinar on nanopowders, copper nanopowders that are mainly used in printed electronics and antiviral applications. And end of February, we will give a webinar on silicon nanopowders that are mainly used for lithium ion batteries. Thank you for attending this webinar and I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you, Johan. Uh, we have got some questions already. Um, the first one asks, or states, it would be interesting to know how plasma, uh, EE, ironized flow can help make in process and how can we control material quality without uh, changing its characteristics? Um, so, sorry, okay, can you yeah. repeat please? Uh, if, if you open the Q&A, it's easier for you to, to read it probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Says it would be interesting to know, uh, it's uh, posted at the 2.29, how mm -hmm. plasma can help make in process and how can we control material quality without changing its characteristics? Uh, the, uh, the material quality is, uh, it's really, it's, uh, we, we usually do some process development. So as we have seen on the molybdenum powder, we do uh, fittings with uh, several flow rates. Then, then uh, we get the, usually the, we, then it depends on yeah, size. There's can be then some parameters found where we get the uh, there's best properties. Uh, the quality of course it always depends on the application. So in some applications uh, it's really very demanding to have the highest ferricity, highest flowability, highest depth density. In other applications maybe there's more required to have a better productivity. Thank you. Uh, another question here, is evaporation an issue of light elements? Um, sorry, I can... Is I, evaporation I, is, an issue I, uh, of light mm -hmm. elements? Mm -hmm. um, so evaporation is, uh, is an issue. So I mean, there, there can be a change of the chemical composition if um, if it's if you have an alloy and you want to keep it exactly the same composition, then uh, volatile elements might evaporate and the composition might slightly change. And then there's also the, an issue that uh, I've not talked about is when we have uh, uh, elements that have a relatively low uh, high vapor pressure at the melting point, then uh, that there is evaporation that uh, takes energy from the plasma that then cannot be used to melt other particles. Uh, to reduce this effect, uh, we can uh, always uh, use a more narrow powder size distribution. 
because it's mostly the evaporation from the fine particles that prevent the melting of the coarser particles. And the next one is the temperature. You simulate the temperature of the core of the particle or the surface temperature. Um, the, in this simulation, I, um, I, I, I'm not aware of the details of the simulation, but uh, yeah, it's uh, the, um, the, like, the, the, the thermal conductivity of the particles is uh, relatively like inside the particles. Of course, the, 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 the heat it uh, comes from the gas to the first to the out, uh, outer surface of the particles and then propagates to the center of the particles. And yeah, usually the heat conductivity inside the particle is uh, relatively high compared to the heat conductivity from the gas to the particle. So that uh, usually the whole particle is molten and, uh, uh, and uh, molten and therefore spheroidized. It can happen that like when we have maybe alloys with a combination of low melting material and high melting material, that the high melting material remains solid. The next question is, what are the typical uncertainties in the numbers you presented, like tap density, ball flow especially? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the whole flow, yeah, as he, he said in the comment, it's, uh, it's unfortunately not a very uh, precise measurement method. And uh, uh, like here on these examples, I don't have the, the values for the uncertainty. But it's, uh, I mean, uh, what we have seen is that yeah, that in most examples that uh, the power, the precursor material, it doesn't flow at all, and uh, the this ferritized powder has a flowability of seven seconds per 50 grams. So there's really a very big change in flowability. Mm. And then of course, yeah, flowability is always a difficult measurement between uh, the effect of the atmosphere with the humidity and so on. Um, it then really depends on the, to, on the application that could need a more spe a specific study. Hmm. I think we, we have one more for you and then we switch to Martin. Uh, the last one for you is how is the particles heated within the plasma by diffusion and conviction from the gas heat transfer coefficient uh, by radiation also from walls directly by in induction within the particles? Mm -hmm. um, I th so I, I mean, if you look at the, I'm not uh, really not, not not an expert for this question, um, but we can have a look at the, the temperature profile again to better understand uh, how the heat transfer works. Yeah. So we, we actually we see the, the induction is mostly here in this area and we observe only a very little temperature increase of the powder particles in this induction in this zone west induction. And actually also the, the the plasma here it screens the electromagnetic field. So there should be very little heating from induction. And we see here the the most heating up is coming from here. And this is actually the, the zone where the plasma has already a relatively lower temperature, which means there should be a less radiation. So I guess it's mostly the convection and uh, diffusion from the gas that heats up the particles. OK, thank you so much, Jochen. I think we mm -hmm. saved the last uh, four minutes for uh, Morten to talk about uh, the application. Uh, which uh, uh, Mila are using Tech 15 for today. So thank you and yeah, thank you. You have to unmute, Martin. Yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear. Okay. Let me just um, share my slides again. If we need to have a second look. Okay. Yes, there were some questions. Uh, let me see. Um, 
yeah, for which applications uh, is the Tech 15 being used uh, at uh, MIL today? So, um, yes, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, unfortunately, I can't uh, talk about uh, all projects as they are um, uh, typically uh, uh, this, um, uh, protected by NDAs and so on. Um, uh, I can, I would like to highlight one uh, very interesting project we are doing uh, right now, and I can talk about that since that's um, a project funded by the Norwegian Resource Council. Uh, it's a project we're doing together with um, uh, one of our main partners, Elcam. Uh, and in that project, uh, Elcam is looking at development of new sil uh, silicon-based alloys, uh, also known as silicides. Uh, and there are many different types of silicides. Uh, um, at the moment, uh, we are looking into nickel silicides. And in, in that uh, project, we are using uh, the plasma spheroidization for um, manufacturing of um, powder for additive manufacturing. So, so it's the project is, as I said, um, um, concerned with um, um, development of new uh, silicon-based alloys for for additive manufacturing. Can you see my slides, by the way? I tried to share them. Um, Anyway, not so important. Yeah, in that case, we, we are using uh, the spheroidization process to make uh, the, the powder for the AM process, as uh, Jochen just uh, explained very well. Uh, and um, in, in this case, the precursor is, again, as we talked about, a crushed material, a milt uh, material. Um, so the, the, the alloy is, is um, produced um, with... Um, uh, with melting out all the alloy elements and the the, um, the solidified uh, new alloy is then milled or crushed down to a powder that we can feed into the uh, the plasma system and um, uh, from there we we produce the spheroidized particles that are of a quality that can be used for uh, additive manufacturing so that is i think one of the best examples that i can talk about uh, today. We have also been uh, looking into recycling uh, of uh, material and, and powder, uh, again, uh, related to additive manufacturing. It is, I would say, um, besides manufacturing of, of powder, one of the probably most interesting applications right now, and we see an increasing interest there. Uh, Jochen also briefly mentioned the reconditioning of powder. Uh, for those of you who are, who are working with additive manufacturing, uh, especially powder bed fusion, you know that uh, there is um, always um, a side stream, a, a, a certain amount of waste material from the powder bed process. Even though we collect all the powders and reuse it, it usually has to be sieved in the net sieving process. Uh, some powder will not be uh, be able to be put back in, back into the uh, the AM process, and also uh, after uh, a certain amount of um, cycles through the the, the AM process, uh, the, the the powder is is not of a quality that can be used for the AM process anymore. However, it's uh, it's still um, so. Therefore, it's often um, regarded as waste, but uh, of course, uh, with a waste material with a very high value, right? So, so uh, it would be great if you could uh, reuse that powder. And the uh, plasma spheroidization process is a brilliant way to recondition powder and feed it back into the AM loop instead of um, considering it as waste and and remelting it. Uh, we are also Thank looking you, uh... at. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we're running out of time. Yes. I'm sorry, but as you can can hear from Martin, um, he's uh, really engaged <laughs> in this matter, and uh, you can for sure get in touch with him or with me or with Jochen, and we will uh, be very happy to uh, ask you questions and uh, tell you more about the Techna systems. So thank you so much, uh, everybody, for attending this webinar, and bye. <laughs>